I'm a yogi Mahajan. And how long have you been in Sahaja Yoga? I came into Sahaja Yoga in 1976. Can you share with us how this happened? Uh, earlier I was uh, giving talks on the Gita and Indian scriptures. And I always knew that there was something, a power within us called the Kundalini. And I was looking for somebody who could ignite it. And in 1976, there was a very small newspaper advertisement saying Kundalini Awakening. In those days, Sage Yoga was not advertised as self-realization. It was advertised as Kundalini Awakening. So I went to the program. It was in a temple in uh, <coughs> Older Delhi. And there was nobody there. I waited for an hour and still there was no sign. So as I was about to leave, I thought I'd got it wrong. Suddenly I hear a car honk and an old ambassador car and uh, Shimaji steps out and I'm at a distance and just as I saw her, my Kundalini shot up. So I knew that this is some divinity. I never met her, I would never seen her before. And then that did it. I was going to ask you how you came to acknowledge Shimonji as the divine, but you seem to have had that happen. That's it. It was experience. It was just a first-hand experience. And then she was very kind. Uh, she said, okay, uh, <coughs> come down to my house. And so the next day onwards, uh, I started going to her house. She was staying with her daughter in uh, Sarvabri Vihar. And there were just a handful of yogis. So they were, uh, people were there the whole day. She was working on one, then the other. In between, she would cook meals. And I was very hesitant to you know, you know, have lunch or meal. And she said, no, you, I'm your mother and you can't uh, leave my house without eating something. So it broke the ice. And then I became like a, a member of the household, running uh, errands and uh, doing all kinds of uh, things. I ended up being her chauffeur for all the programs. So it, be it became closer and closer like that. As you came to meet Shimonji and to know her, how did you move beyond the Maya of Shimonji as a person to realize her divine nature? I think initially it was uh, essential to know her as a person for me to open up. Because if we uh, have a distance, uh, we don't open our heart. And the many secrets buried in our heart, uh, which you can like, you can say our conditioning, which maybe never, are never revealed and therefore those uh, negativity uh, keep sticking in those places. But if you are, say, with a close friend, you open up and you pour out your heart, you pour out your woes. And I think that uh, allowed her to get insight into me and uh, my problems. And, you know, we would go for movies, we would go to the theater, she would be having popcorn, she would be having a Coke, and, you know, it would just be very informal. I could tell her anything and she could tell me anything. So she got to know what are my uh, blocks and conditionings, however learned I may seem to be with uh, scriptures and so forth. So that part of me, uh, she could deal with. In a way, Shimaji was a personal guru for you. Many people didn't have that direct relationship. Yes, people. yes. But now I feel that because she has done, uh, she's had that insight into the human uh, being and various categories of human beings, various combinations and permutations. And she's talked about it over four to six thousand lectures. If we listen to this, there will always a me somewhere that you would relate to. Yes, that's me. So, uh, so that uh, has evolved into a more collective experience. experience. Have you ever thought about why faith puts you in this position? Because out of the billions of people on the earth, you found yourself in a place where you can very close to humanity and spend much time with them. Have you wondered why you? 
I guess uh, it was a grace. I mean, there's nothing special about me. <laughs> I think uh, I'm just a regular guy like everybody else. So I think just her grace. And I think somebody had to be with her. So, you know, whoever is, you know, Hari, me or somebody, we, we had somebody had to be with her. You were involved in the early days of, of Sahaja Yoga from the start. Yeah. You've seen Sahaja Yoga develop from yeah. a few people to yeah. what it has become today. Yeah. How did Shumanji bring this about? Well, uh, I often, often asked myself the same question that uh, how Sahaja Yoga changes each year, how she says different things to us each year she comes or each, year, each time we meet her. It's like She's putting us to another level. And then I realized that she's taking us only that far at a time as far as we can absorb. So it was not like she gave us lessons on Sage Yoga or there was a uh, complete uh, theory of Sage Yoga unfolded uh, in a period of time. Uh, it was uh, organic growth. As we grew a few inches, uh, she could uh, pour in a little bit more uh, manure and a little bit more water and then see that, okay, now we we can take that much. And then the next step. So even the techniques changed in that period. <clears throat> a lot of times, uh, earlier days, she would physically put her hand on the chakra. She would physically uh, work on us and so forth. But then uh, as... Uh, a certain number of people got their realization. The process uh, grew uh, in the ether. The term uses it became morphogenic. So there was a resonance that could happen even without her touching. It could happen even without her being in there. It could even happen uh, in her absence. Earlier, her presence was very necessary. But over a period of time, uh, people could get realization, uh, even just having a photograph there. Uh, it worked like that. Many people talk about how Sahaja Yoga is the integration of all the yogic paths, the yeah. yoga, yeah, 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 yoga, yeah, yeah. different types of yoga. So there's different techniques, clearing, yeah. meditation, and there's yeah. puja and devotion. For yogis in their ascent, how do they integrate all those different paths to really make progress in Sahaja Yoga? I think more, it has grown even beyond that. There was, uh, of course, it was necessary to take the essences of all the, what all the prophets came, they laid the stepping stones. Uh, but you know, now the human brain has grown into another dimension. You can say we were 3G before and now we are 4G. So the uh, Sage Yoga is much more uh, advanced than anything that had happened before. So it's, it's, it's taken a life of its own, uh, which is uh, like she's written a book, Meta Science. So it's uh, meta modern. It's beyond whatever happened before. I do want to just talk on the, the question of a yogi spiritual progression. Yeah. So many yogis clear, yeah. and meditate, and they do puja. Are these things enough to really advance in Sahaja Yoga or do you need to also take no. up her work and do other things? Well, it's the, the most important thing is that she has to be in your heart. You know the story of Linda Williams? Please. Well, you know how she was so caught up when she came to Sahaja Yoga because she'd been to a false guru and all those problems. And she was uh, there in the early 70s, even before I came, and then she had epilepsy, all those things. So, uh, 20 years on, one day she was very depressed and she was in tears and, you know, she, she said to Shimaji, you know, I've been so long in Sage Yoga and I'm still having these problems. This chakra is blocked, that is happening. So, Shimaji said, Linda, do you love me? She said, of course, Mother, I love you. She said, that's enough. So, if you love her, then it takes you to another level altogether, beyond anything that you do, pujas, uh, programs. You know, all this is happening, but it's not your uh, 
prime goal. The prime goal is to please her, to express that love. So when you express that love, it's not deliberate. It's not mental. It is just flowing. So in that flow, you're not even aware what you're doing. <laughs> Am I going to program? Am I doing sage yoga work? You're just enjoying. And you just love. And that love uh, somehow does everything. If you, for instance, if you love somebody and it's Christmas, and the spirit of Christmas, and you just want to uh, go and buy presents for a whole lot of people. Now you don't even think where the money is going to go, come from, how much is my budget. It's just spontaneously it's done and it's, you go and do it and it's, it's over. So you don't think you're doing anything for anybody. If you're doing a public program, you don't think you're doing anything for anybody. You're doing it for yourself. Because you, it's giving you more and more joy. You're just bubbling. And the joy goes on like the waves of the ocean. And you know, it goes on rising higher and higher. So there's never a thought that I have to do puja. Even if you don't do it, it doesn't matter. Because every morning you worship. It's a very interesting point. I have heard you maybe say in the talk that your highest principle in Sajjaya is divine love. Absolutely. But it's expressing it, living it, and being an instrument of it. Absolutely. Can you speak a little bit more about how you've seen that divine love in your life? Uh, well, I think being with her, there was nothing but love all the time. And she never thought of her physical comfort, first of all. Uh, that was something. Like once uh, we were going for a program to Hyderabad from Pune and uh, I had booked her in a first class air conditioned coach. And as we reached the platform, uh, joining the air conditioned coach was uh, what we call a third class general compartment. And she just stood there and she looked at that and she saw all these people there and uh, she looked at the first class uh, and there were only two or three people. And she said, no, I like to go in that. So I said, Shimaji, you know, that, uh, that's a very ordinary compartment. It's hot, it's sticky, it's messy and people are just uh, like sandwiches on top of each other. She said, but then I can give red eyes to so many more people. So fine, she got onto it. And uh, as the word, sp word spread that she's Sri Mataji and she's uh, in the compartment, everybody in the compartment queued up and each compartment is connected to the next. So the whole night she was giving realization to people and she was loving it, she was enjoying it. She was, uh, somebody was bringing her paratha, somebody was bringing their <laughs> home cooked bhaji and she was just having everything there, you know. And I was getting worried and worried because in the next day was her public program in Hyderabad. And she had no sleep, it was four in the morning. And I said, now how is she going to do the public program? So I had to literally beg and fold my hands to the people, please stop. You can come to her public program, she'll be there. And uh, <coughs> eventually by five, uh, she could get a, an hour's rest because at six, seven we were at the Hyderabad rail station. Now, Hyderabad was a new city for us. It was her first public program. And uh, there were hardly a handful of Soviet yogis to organize it. So we didn't have any hopes that there'd be maybe 50 or 60 people. But through the train, about four or 500 people had got her realization in the train. And they were so excited they spread the word in Hyderabad and we ended up getting 2,000 people for the public program. So love, you know, emits its own waves and, bring, and spreads love and brings back love. It comes back to you, you know, like the river is flowing and then from the banks as it's kissing the shores, the love comes back to you. So her, uh, her she was like that. I mean, she could just uh, be so ordinary with the ordinary, even a sweeper or, and talk to them one-to-one uh, -one and, you know, so what is your, how is your husband doing and what did you cook tonight and, uh, okay, what is the recipe of that? And, and the next thing, she's given the girl a realization and, you know, the person is, hi. <laughs> Can you perhaps share some more aspects of the Divine Love of Shimanji and how it manifests? Yeah, there are actually so many. 
And uh, I remember one, uh, we were uh, in somebody's house and uh, a cup of tea was offered to her by the maid. And uh, the maid accidentally dropped the tea on her sari, and it was a new sari. And, you know, she was petrified. I mean, she was, uh, she was almost, uh, almost fainted that she did such a thing. And she might have just smiled and poured the rest of the tea on her sari. See, I can, I'm also spilled the tea on my sari. So, don't feel bad. I'm glad you spilled it because I wanted to get another sari. And very radiantly, she reappeared with the sari and smiled at the girl and hugged her. And, and uh, that was it. So, the, that love is so much related to other people's feelings. It's not uh, just that that she's giving, it's also she's feeling you and your uh, sorrow that uh, she immediately responds to how to uh, raise your level and bring you back from that feeling. Like uh, uh, there was a case where uh, stones were thrown at her in uh, Maharashtra at a public program. And uh, the sage yogis were very, very upset so her uh, thing was not that stones were thrown at her. Her feeling was that my children are feeling so bad. And you know, everybody went into the left and you know, uh, of course people wanted to retaliate and all that and she said, no, nothing doing. So the, that evening, the, she spent the whole evening trying to uplift their spirits, telling them, uh, uh, hilarious uh, jokes and anecdotes and because next year was New Year's and she didn't want everybody to start New Year with their spirits down. So her concern is always others, how to raise their spirit, how to take them out of uh, uh, the mire. So she's always thinking of us. It's not about herself. I mean, uh, I don't ever remember her saying that, you know, I, I, I would have this, I would like to have that. No, never. I mean, I, I remember when we went to Brahmapuri, uh, uh, I was sharing, uh, it was a servant quarter basically, because uh, at that time there were no constructions in Brahmapuri. So she was staying in a servant quarter. And uh, I went looking for the bathroom and there was no bathroom. So I asked uh, the host that, you know, where would Shimaji go for a bathroom? So, no, just outside, uh, behind the wall. And I, I was aghast. I said, you mean all these years she's coming here and you've been, uh, ha you, you didn't even have a bathroom for her? So I said, but she said well, we never had the money. So I said, here is the money. <laughs> when she comes next day, there must be a toilet. But she never ever complained. She never ever mentioned it. Otherwise, you know, to build a small bathroom doesn't cost very much. But she never thinks about herself. That's the point. Whether she's had food, whether it's always her children. For instance, uh, this is going back to uh, Kabela when we had just purchased Kabela and it was the first Guru Puja. Uh, just two days later was a Guru Puja. So there wasn't uh, a time to, enough time to even arrange a caterer. She set up uh, a kitchen in the front of the courtyard of the castle and each one of us was assigned one fire and one uh, cauldron. <laughs> well, I, mine was turkey and which was very tough and it wouldn't cook. So I was having a hard time. So we were expecting about 300 uh, yogis. She cooked for 300 yogis and uh, 500 turned up. But with her blessing of Annapurna, there was enough food for everybody. And people were licking their fingers because it was so delicious and so full of vibrations. So when, uh, after the puja, the food was offered to her at the dinner at the, in her bedroom, she just had one morsel and she says, I'm so satisfied. So I said, Shima, you've not even eaten. She said, no, your nabis are so satisfied that my nabi is completely satisfied. So 
it showed that how much we were how much we were a part of her we were like cells in her body that anything that we felt immediately recorded on her and it could satisfy her or it could dissatisfy her. for instance uh, there was uh, at one uh, instance there was a tiff between two leaders and uh, she she came to the puja and then she said i don't feel like doing the puja i don't feel uh, uh, the welcome because there's too much tension so she just had people to do the bhajans and that's it whereas Uh, there was a holy puja in uh, delhi where hari was also there and they <coughs> made all the preparations for the holy puja <coughs> and then she was so happy uh, with the joy from our hearts because holy is a very festive time and <coughs> that joy uh completely fulfilled her and she said just sing and dance today don't do puja and that's the puja so we all just sang and we all just danced and we put color on each other and we put color on her and she put color on us and uh, that was a puja that was joy so that concern is comes from that love because it's so it's you saw so part of it so organic that a mother feels everything that her child is doing and the child feels everything that her mother is doing and it's not limited to only sage yogi she feels it for the whole world and that is her concern how to save everybody and that is why she's she's always urging us go get them go save them she's seeing them drowning she wants to salvage them she sees her children getting lost she wants them to return that is her motherly concern nothing else it's not uh how much money you will get how big a car you will get will you get a big house those are not the things she wants to save her children her souls the lost souls mm-hmm. could chase some more the divine love i think people appreciate yeah so uh whenever uh, there used to be a public program and she would see these after the program she would uh, allow the seekers to come and she would work on each seeker individually and you know like russia 5000 seekers some program 10000 seekers program would finish say 10 o'clock at night and then there'd be a queue of 500 thousand seekers waiting the night each one she wants to work on and it would go on till 2 3 in the morning and we would have to literally beg people to stop coming but to her it was not the exhaustion or the pain or it was here's another lost child who has come home to me here's another child who's come home to me and it would give her more and more joy that you know another lost soul has been found so it did not uh any human being would have been exhausted tired but it seemed to revive her more and more that was a fascinating thing to see i mean at 4 and 4 o'clock in the morning we were finished you know we may have been four or five uh, people around her and we were literally drooping her eyes were closing <laughs> but we would look at her and she was beaming more and more radiant i mean you could literally see as though you know beams of light are coming out of her face and her eyes are shining her eyes are shining literally that you can see the light coming out of her eyes so that was the joy that 
but there were also calamities. For instance, uh, when she came back from uh, uh, Kabela to India in, uh, in the winter and she heard that there was an earthquake in Latur and uh, people were suffering and there was no food. So she uh, bought truckloads of seeds, she vibrated them, she said, send them to the farmers. Uh, tell them to sow these seeds. I vibrate and I bless them. And you know, they, even if it's parched land, the, the crops will come up. So she would spend uh, weeks just doing that because she want, you know, her heart was pining for the poor, for the suffering, for the farmers, and she just wanted to do something for them. So there was a part of her which was. Uh, into saving people, their soul, their spirits. And there was a part of her which wanted to reach out to the suffering humanity. And uh, you, you've heard the story why she started the NGO in Noida. Uh, you know, how she was traveling uh, once and the car had failed and she got off the car and on the roadside she saw that uh, these women who've been uh, thrown away by their husband with several kids around them and breaking stones, that's how they were, you know, making their living. And uh, <coughs> they barely had threadbare saris on them. And uh, when she saw that, she sat on a rock and she started weeping and she said, how to help them? And that's when she resolved that I would start a place for destitute women and often children. And that's how the NGO in Delhi, Nirmal Prem Ashram, uh, got started. She, it was all from her own money. And she, felt, she just was so happy when it happened. You know, she just felt that her, her inner desire, and she would just say that, you know, somehow if you can help me to fulfill my inner desire, my inner pain. So that pain got released. Please continue. Stories of Antarctica. <laughs> 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 we never tire them. Yeah, but uh, of course, there's so many. I've written a book uh, with my experiences called Inspirations. <coughs> and. Uh, it comes to mind. Uh, yeah, so a lot of uh, things like that. And she was very concerned uh, about uh, people's feelings. That even when you are. Uh, sp talking of sage yoga, uh, you should never hurt somebody's feelings. You should not directly say, oh, you have an ego or uh, there's a boot inside of you uh, or you are, uh, uh, you have this uh, block, that block, because she, she said that uh, don't make somebody feel small. So the way she would uh, talk or give realization, she would uh, go down a roundabout way and uh, put it on someone else. For instance, if she wanted to correct us, if we'd done something and she wanted to correct us and she didn't want to hurt us directly by saying, don't do this you, or you've done this mistake. So she would say, you know, Sir CP doesn't like uh, this kind, this, this, this. And often I would wonder, but Sir CP was never there when I did this. <laughs> and then it occurred to me that she's, to she's telling me, but if she had told me directly, I would feel very hurt and, you know, that I offended Srimati, I did this, I shouldn't have done that. But by putting it on Sir CP, I got the message in a roundabout way. And so it was uh, not hurtful. Or if she uh, wanted to point out to some... Uh, fault and she would say oh, but you know sir cp is like this so we would laugh thinking that sir cp is like that but actually it was nothing to do with sir cp <laughs> uh, it was about us so you have to have it's again a, it's it's again a, a mother's way of loving her children you know she wouldn't tell them directly and she would uh, say it in a way that 
they would realize that they shouldn't be doing this because Sir C.P. doesn't like it. We've spoken a lot about Shumanji's divine love, but there were other aspects of the divine incarnation that sometimes would manifest when she needed to correct us, yeah. to, to yeah. turn things in a different way. What, what is your experience there? Well, if she had to fight negativity, if she had to fight a bhoot, she would be like a tigress. All her weapons, she could shout at you, she could yell at you. And uh, the boots would run away. So she would tell us later on, you know, don't get frightened if I yell at somebody and if I shout at somebody. I mean, her temper could explode. It was like the showering of all the weapons of the Devi. And uh, one couldn't take it. So then as she told us that, uh, uh, you know, this is the way the boots run away. So we said, Shumaji, then please shout at us that our boots will run away. <laughs> so she said, you can't take it. And uh, that's why she hasn't uh, manifested in her Mahakali mode. But when the things went uh, all wrong, uh, for instance, the press, if they criticized her or tried to throw mud at her, she would fight back. She, there, were, there were cases in uh, India, in Maharashtra, there was uh, the newspapers in uh, Pune. And uh, this is the time that Pratishthan was under construction. 1986 and they, uh, the collector of the Pune uh, thought that she was making a commercial building whereas she was making a farmhouse and some builders uh, tried to insinuate that you know she's making a commercial property in a farmland this is a green zone where Pratishtan is it's a green zone you can't make a commercial building there but you can make a farmhouse there so their uh, contention was that how can she make such a big farmhouse? Now at that time, there was no restriction on the size of a farmhouse. That law came after 1986. But the collector issued a demolition notice. And uh, we went to the courts and finally got a stay. But the newspapers only published the version of the politicians, the collector, that she's doing things illegal, she's uh, using the money of her disciples, she's, you know, they tried to uh, throw all kind of things at her. So she fought back. She called a press conference and she showed them everything. She showed them the house plans. She showed that this has been sanctioned by the local Gram Panchayat. It's not illegal. She showed her husband's account, bank account, that all the money has come from Sir C.P.'s uh, funds. He was the Secretary General of Maritime. This is how much he gets this each year. This is how much he had saved. This is the bank balance. We have all the accounts, the money she spent on the construction. She's everything black and white. So most newspapers published her version of the story and the matter ended. But there was one newspaper, a mischievous one, which was uh, politically motivated, called Sakal newspaper. And it refused to publish her version. So she went to the court. There's a system in India that if you have a grievance against anything that the press publishes, you can take it to court and it, that court is called the Press Council of India. So she showed them everything. She had lawyers. She wrote out the whole petition herself, gave all the proofs. The matter was heard by the Press Council and a few months later they issued an order in her favour ordering the Sakal newspaper that they should apologise and also publish her version. 
so her message was that if you don't neutralize the negativity it goes on attacking you so you must neutralize the negativity come what may whatever it takes and the same thing happened in los angeles there was a show called murph griffin show and uh, they had invited her for a national broadcast on the tv so she came all the way from london flew all the way at her expense to uh, do that program and uh, she was at the studios for the recording they wouldn't call her and then uh, murph griffin was suddenly i suppose approached by uh, some cult which is against say yoga that they shouldn't interview her so he made an excuse that you know the time ri- ran out so we couldn't interview you so she said no she filed a court case against murph griffin which meant that she would have to come and go to and fro from london to la which is not a short distance which is no i will do that and we were trying to be worried that you know she would have to come for every hearing she attended each and every single hearing but before even the case could be decided the divine intervened and uh, buff griffin went bust the bend bankrupt So when it comes to fighting negativity she fights like a tigress whether it's press whether it is uh, governments whether it is uh, any leader any prime minister any if they if they are hurting her children she will go to the other end to save them you know the heavens may fall but she will stand up and she'll save each and every child. I'm going to ask you a controversial question. Some people take that standing up for negativity at all costs with inside yoga and they criticize and attack other side yoga thinking that they are confronting negativity or thinking that they're working to preserve sahaja yoga. But the means by which they do that can be quite aggressive towards other side yoga. No, uh, it's nothing to do with other sage yogi. If you are fighting negative which is coming from outside, then uh, how are you being aggressive to sage yogis? I I will I'll explain to you in another way. Shimaji uh, was uh, often uh, she must have heard she talks about uh, in the bible the kundli has been described as tongues of flame so my question was that if it's tongues of flame that means it's fire and yet the kundli gives us a cooling feeling so how is it a just a, uh, you know it's a juxtaposition so she explained that the kundli has a capacity to burn if we didn't have the capacity to burn then how will it burn negativity but once it has burnt the negativity then it gives you the cooling effect that's why when people come to public programs first they feel the heat coming up on top of their head and then later on or a few days later they start feeling the cool vibrations so she said the kundalini never forgives because if she forgives she will leave the negativity alone so let it be then how will the negativity be burnt so she has to burn the negativity that's her job because if she can if she doesn't clean it she can't evolve she can't go to the next step so we have to address we have to fight where the children's innocence is being challenged we have to take a stand against all these things about uh now they are making same sex marriages legal not just that the uh cup, the same sex couple can also adopt children now what will happen is if when they adopt these children 
the children will grow up thinking that this is a normal way of life. So they are going to do the same thing. So we are attacking the innocence of the primordial being. So we cannot accept that. We have to challenge it. We have to oppose it. Come what may. Uh, it may make us unpopular. People may think we are uh, not modern, but it doesn't matter. Uh, we have to st uh, stand by our dharma. It doesn't matter whether we succeed or we fail, but we have to stand by it. That's the point. It's not whether we succeed. There is, uh, with social media, many people criticizing other yogis, and there's division in Sahaja Yoga today. What's your view of this? You know, these are people who have not felt the joy. Because what happens is, Sage Yoga is an open door. Everybody can come in and call himself a Sage Yoga. Some people have been doing Sage Yoga for 10 years, some people have been doing it for 20 years, but they never felt the joy. They were so busy be doing programs, doing organizing Sage Yoga, running here, running there. So they never meditated even. They thought that they were working for Sage Yoga. So that's it. Now, a lot of people, uh, along with Hari and me, were with Sri Mataji. And there were other people also. Uh, they've gone. And they were with her. Not for one year, not for two. They were with their years together. Because they thought they were with Sri Mataji, so they don't have to meditate. She's doing it for them. And then, uh, once she took Samadhi, uh, they, were, they were lost. And they said, well, why am I doing this? So they left Sahaja Yoga, they quit. And these are people who are visible on so many videos of hers, walking with her, traveling with her, everything. Hari knows them. But uh, they, where are they? So it doesn't mean that you know, you're doing work for Sahaja Yoga, you're uh, high visibility. But you're not meditating. And if you don't meditate, you will not get the joy. So these are people who have not experienced their joy. They can drop out any minute from Sage Yoga, at any pretext. Their ego can be hurt, somebody may have been rude to them. So I know of people who have been leaders of Delhi, and he tried to meet Srimaji once, and somebody said she's busy, and he got so offended, he left Sage Yoga. So, if you experience the joy, it doesn't matter. You'll just say, oh, let's just be patient with somebody who's done something. Just be patient with him. He'll come around. She, she was so patient with us. She didn't throw us out. She you know, gave us the, as much time as we needed to come around. Some were late bloomers. Uh, but she didn't give up on anybody. As long as we called her mother, she said, I'll never give up on him. I cannot. So we shouldn't give up on each other. Yes, they're mistakes. But the social media itself has become an instrument of negativity. So everything today is by the uh, denomination of the social media. Even doing Sahaja Yoga now is through social media. And people who have joined 20 groups, somebody joined 15 groups. So if you are uh, buzzing with <laughs> 15 groups every day, where will you have time to do Sage Yoga? Other day I, I met a Sage Yogini and she said, I'm in a group which uh, uh, share our dreams. So all of us put our dreams on that uh, channel and then we interpret each other's dreams. So I said, you know, dreams come from the subconscious. And sub subconscious means you're going to the left side. And when you go on the left side and just go into each other's dreams, you will go into the uh, collective subconscious. All the boots will catch you. What is the need to do all this? Because these people have not experienced the joy. So they feel, they're insecure. They feel they need to belong to something. They need to belong to a club. They want a membership. So that gives them a feeling of belonging. So they want to belong to these groups. And then, that's how they identify themselves. <coughs> so then, all these things start. On that same point, talking about evolution, two 
people that are new metro manager, you wish I'd give people coming into Santiago. What advice would you give them about the best ways they can advance in Santiago? The best way to advance in Santiago is just to feel the love for Shimaji and feel the joy. Nothing else matters. But one thing for sure, you have to clear your chakras on a daily basis. That she has said that apply it to you, her advice, and ask yourself how, pers how much percentage of this advice am I following. Normally, when she gives a talk and she's talk about some uh, negative thing in people or in their character or in their habits, people think that she's talking about somebody else. So they ignore it. But she said, when I say that, I'm addressing you. I am saying this is in you. I may not name you by person, but it is meant for you. We take it otherwise. So they should write down and say how much, how much percentage am I following it? So what percentage am I Sage Yogi? Am I part-time Sage Yogi? Am I full-time Sage Yogi? And then a lot of people postpone it. Okay. You know, she said this, maybe when I retire, I will do this. Or maybe when I uh, have free time or when I'm on vacation. Now, Sehej Yoga has its own speed. And if you don't tune it in that speed, you will get left behind. It's not something that you can postpone. So... Shimaji told somebody, okay, now get rid of this. So one person said, okay, I'll do it over the weekend. Another person said, oh, maybe tomorrow, day after. A third said, I'll do it right now. So Shimaji said, that's talking like a sage. Okay. So this postponement thing is a way of escaping the issue. So how many times are we trying to escape inconvenient issues that apply to us, which we don't want to face. We're not ready to face. Yes, we will do Sage Yoga, but I'm not ready to face this in me. So you lost the speed, you lost the momentum. So Sage Yoga has gone ahead and you're left behind. What about yogis that um, have an issue, they leave the collective, they talk to other yogis, other yogis give them sympathy, they go on the internet. You know, we should not throw a sage yogi out. We can say, okay, stay at the back. Don't uh, try to take over situations. You know, for a while, you need to work out something. So just please keep at the back. We have to give them a chance. But that's not saying that we should sympathize with that person. We should have empathy. Because then you will catch his problem. We have to help each other. So we have to help each other by not uh, having sympathy with them. Then he'll never improve because he'll think he's on the right. At the same time, you don't uh, uh, go against him. You don't ostracize anybody. That's the other part of it. I'm going to ask you a question about uh, Sir CP. He, some people have created a controversy around his role in Sajaga. They've criticized him. And today, Perhaps his standing in Sahajoga is not what it should be given his status and his role in Sahajoga. What's your view? Well, Shimaji has always praised him and uh, he stood by her throughout, uh, physically, financially, morally. So he was a great support to him. He may not have initially uh, followed Sahaja Yoga. But he was always supporting her. She said he may not do Sage Yoga, but he uh, gives me whatever help we need. And then in the years that 
uh, Shimanji was not so visible, he held the fort. Whatever advice, whatever guidelines she had given, he followed them and uh, worked very hard. I mean, in his 80s, at that age, he would travel for Sage Yoga. Morning to night, he would attend to uh, the problems of Sage Yoga, the organization issues of Sage Yoga. So, he, he was a pillar of Sage Yoga. But he never sought uh, any acknowledgement for it. He never uh, wanted any thanks for it. So it didn't matter whether he was given that uh, respect or that status, but he never asked for it, he never wanted it. He has his own uh, persona as a very great and a successful career, which culminated in the topmost position which any bureaucrat would ever aspire to have. He was uh, honored by the country. He was awarded the highest awards of uh, Padma Vibhushan by the country. What else <laughs> can be, how, how else can he be honored? Every, and not only India, but other countries also. So uh, it doesn't, it's not important. It was never important to him. Uh, so it's not important. He will always be remembered for what he did for Sage Yoga. And uh, very few people know it. Uh, it was he who donated uh, Pratishthan to Sahaja Yoga. Of course, Shimaji built it, but it was built with his money. So she never wanted to interfere uh, with his money and what he does with his money. She, she had left the choice to him. And uh, he made that choice out of his own free will to donate something that was built with his hard-earned money, lifelong hard-earned money, to give it to Sahaja Yoga. It speaks for itself. My last question. You've been a Sahaja Yogi for 40 years, where, as we've discussed, many have fallen by the wayside. What has been the secret to that longevity and staying in Sahaja Yoga? It is that I'm still learning about Sahaja Yoga. <laughs> Each day, I wake up in the morning thinking, I know nothing about Sage Yoga. And I'm reminded of Socrates, you know, people said that you're a very knowledgeable man. And he said, yes, I'm knowledgeable because I know that I know nothing. Whereas you don't know that you know nothing. So if you talk about the divine and the ways of the God, I, I am just wonderstruck each day <coughs> that we know so little about him. We know so little or nothing about the divine. Whatever aspects we know of Shrimadji are those that she uh, allowed us to see. But uh, there was so much more that our uh, limited vision can never envisage. But off and on, she blesses us with a glimpse and uh, we are overjoyed and we thrill with it. Those are her blessings, whatever she wants us to see. Oh, I'm going to ask you about some of the big projects. So let's talk about ice tests. You had a very crucial role in how yeah, it started. Please yeah, share that story. Yeah, yeah. You know, when you see what's happening to the children in the West, child abuse, uh, all these things about uh, children uh, uh, being allowed to choose their own gender. I don't know if you know, but in America, uh, there are schools that say the choice should be left to the child to decide whether it's he, he wants to be a he or a she. And... Uh, that has to be his decision, not the parents. So they have common bathrooms now. There are no more uh, boys' bathrooms, separate girls' bathrooms, because all lines of gender are to be erased. So what's going to happen to these societies? 
and that uh, overwhelms us so much that we, more than anything else, we want to save the innocent of the people. So the schools like ISPS should be everywhere, whether it's uh, Cabela, whether it's Boratine, Australia. We have to go all out to save these children. Can you share how ISPS done? Well, it was a very funny story because, uh, as you know, it was a farmhouse that I had inherited from my father. He had a 50-acre orchard and I had about part of it. And I had uh, a dairy farm there. Summers, I would be there. So one fine morning, I got a call from Srimatiji from Switzerland. And she said, you know, I'm sending you uh, seven children from Switzerland because uh, the Swiss school has closed. There was some government problem with it. It was not recognized. And suddenly these children had nowhere to go. So can you keep them uh, in your farmhouse? So I said, of course, you must. Be. And uh, so they arrived. And a month later, the Australians got wind of it. You know, they're very alert. <laughs> they're like Shimaji's Ganas. So they got wind of it and said, you know, Shimaji, you know, we have these children. We had at that end of the school in Melbourne. And the same thing happened, school closed because it was not recognized by the government. And uh, there were 25 children. So Shimaji, can we send them also to Dharamsala? So she said, let me check with Yogi if he can make arrangements. I said, sure, Shimaji, we can add some more bathrooms. And you know, I have uh, these, the old barn and I can renovate it and uh, make it into the dorms. So 25 children arrived from Australia. So suddenly we had a small little school going. Uh, we got teachers from here and there, local teachers mostly, not, not say yogis. And uh, so the school started. And uh, the children started sending reports home. The parents were very happy. and. Uh, the word got around all over the world. So more and more applications came to Shimaji from Europeans, from Americans, uh, Indians. It was only meant for, uh, right that time, for the Westerners. So then there came issue that, you know, how to adjust so many uh, students. So at that time, Shimaji got this plot from uh, Sidco in New Bombay. CBD Belapur, they used to call it Vashi in those days. So she said, okay, uh, in December when you come for the Ganpati Pule, you can bring you all, your, all your children and we'll admit them here. So we had about 120 children and uh, the place was not even fully ready. It was just halfway through and we were just pushing it, pushing it, you know, each day a little room each day, one extra bathroom. So day by day, it grew. Come summers, this place gets very humid and uh, there are a lot of mosquitoes. And these children were suddenly in a very uh, alien, hostile environment. And they developed all kinds of diseases. Somebody got malaria, somebody got uh, typhoid, somebody had this, and the place became a hospital. So then Shimai said, this climate will not suit them. You take them back to Dharamsala. And she gave me 10 lakhs rupees. You build a school for them. And again, the Australians, as always, were on the forefront. They sent their builders. They sent their carpenters. Uh, John Henwood? Paul Henwood. Paul Henwood. Uh, so he was the builder of the team. and. So this very fairy tale like castle was built and my brother, he also gave 10 lakhs and also gave his land. This is Sonu's father. And we had the school ready uh, in, a, in a record time. So another 100 kids came over by the next year. So this was the growth. It happened by itself. It was never planned. We didn't even have Sage Yogi teachers, but over a period of time, we could uh, get more and more Sage Yogi teachers. And that's how it happened. On behalf of the Vajjogi, I must say thank you to yourself for 
your visionary role in giving the land and supporting the school. Without your contribution, maybe the school wouldn't have started. So on behalf of all of us, publicly, I say thank you for. You know, I would, I would just say thank you to Shimaji that she allowed this to happen. To end, I'd also like to say thank you for being yogi because you've been a stalwart of Sage Yoga for 40 years, an inspiration to many of us. And um, on behalf of all of us, I'll say you want to be an older statesman and a living treasure of Sage Yoga. Well, thank you, sir. I started doing something new. We are making uh, episodes of Sage Yoga on social issues. And you can see them on YouTube. The channel is Meta Modern Productions. Chronicle. So we've done six episodes covering uh, drug problems, uh, women problems, corruption problems, things that Shimaji's talked about and then show, showing in the end what Shimaji said about it. So this can be shared with non -seju. This is These are made especially for non -sejus. So if anybody of you wants to contribute stories or uh, ideas for future uh, episodes, we're going to be making them every month one episode, you can send them to me. Yes, sir.